Namaskar. Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I am your host Sri Ayer on our ongoing series on Mission Marigold. We are going to be talking about a very interesting personal experience today. And in fact, we are also going to be doing a role reversal where Chandil Kumar Balasubramaniam that you have met in a previous episode will be talking to me about what my grandfather did, his experiences in the Royal Indian Navy. So now let's welcome Kumar Bala. Kumar, Namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel. How are you? Namaskaram and Manakam to all. Glad to be here. Thank you so much, Kumar. And I thought we will just recap one quick video about the contribution of Indian soldiers to World War One and Two before we jump into today's topic. With your permission, I'd like to play this video, please. Yes, please, sir. Go ahead. At the outset, let me tell you that Kumar did all the research. All I did was merely put them and add some music. Kumar, hats off to you. 
wonderful compilation of data. I think now we have come to the topic that we're going to discuss about. Uh, Kumar, a little bit about your family members participated in the Indian Armed Forces. Doesn't matter which branch of the Armed Forces. And after that, I can tell you about mine. Over to you. I come from the Congo region of Tamil Nadu. Like if you look at historically, my ancestors fought in the, the first and the second Carnatic Wars. The famous heroes of that time would have been people like Deeran Chinnamalai and uh, Katapuman and Pulitevar, etc. For some reason or the other, our history rarely talks about these critical battles, the heroes who fought in those wars and uh, the consequences of it, right? And then it gets worse when we come down to the 20th century. A lot of uh, people from Tamil Nadu fought in uh, various battles, part of various battle regiments across Europe and not just from Tamil Nadu, uh, from all over India. It, it somehow we don't study what happened to them and, and their history, right? So we do really need to knowing uh, what happened in the past, like the you know the famous African proverb that say goes, uh, unless the lions have their own historians, the hunt will always glorify the hunter, right? So we start to valorize the lions amongst our ancestors who fought bravely. In my case, it's interestingly, my wife's mother and father they both met at the when they were serving in the Indian Army and her uh, grandfather fought in the Second World War. Right? So we do need to remember our personal connections to these historical events, right? I mean, something that Americans and the British and the Europeans do really well is to keep that connection alive. And I think we need to do the same. So I'm really keen on knowing your personal connection to the to the Second World War. Right? Thank you so much. And, and the picture you saw and the last one on that video was that of my grandfather, Kanjeevaram S. Natarajan. And he was born in 1904. He was in the Royal Indian Navy in the late 30s too early 40s and I'll come to that in just one moment. Also, one other grandson of his, through his son's side, uh, he served in the Air Force as a group captain. So we have continued to contribute to the Indian Armed Forces in one capacity or the other. So Kumar, I promised in a previous uh, episode on Mission Marigold that I would talk about my grandfather's experiences in uh, Royal Indian Navy. So we can talk about it at any time. Uh, maybe if you want to add something, go ahead and then we can jump into that. No, I'm keen on knowing about uh, your granddad's story. I think, it, it, as I mentioned before, it's really important that we keep these personal connections alive and we document it for the posterity, right? Like because our future generations need to know these stories. And if we don't tell our own, <laughs> as the, as I mentioned before, we have to valorize our lines in the, from the past, right? Go ahead. Absolutely. So uh, his name was Kanjeevaram Natarajan and he was a bit of a genius uh, in his own right. Born in 1904, in the 1920s, he graduated with a master's in mathematics from the presidency college in the presidency of Madras. In the MA program, there were only four students. He was a lone Indian. The other three were Europeans. And uh, he was a powerhouse in mathematics. He was really, really good at it. Unfortunately, he couldn't seek employment. He couldn't find employment in Madras at that point of time. So he had to go to Alapura to work in the kingdom of Travancore as a lecturer for some years. Didn't, things didn't work out. Then he bounced from you know various jobs and things like that. And then finally, he ended up at the Royal Indian Navy as the ship's accountant. So it looks like these big ships, uh, by the time the Second World War came along, these were very big ships and they needed an accountant to sort of manage the expenses as they went from port to port looking at things, supplies, as well as, you know, all the other expenses that go with running of a ship. This was wartime. A lot of tension used to be there. So this is the story that he told us when we were growing up. So in February 1943, Subhash Chandra Bose escaped or quietly left Germany for Japan in a U-181 or some U-boat. It's I don't remember the exact number. I think it is U-181. The date is given as 8th February 1943. And then he sailed along the western uh, coast of Africa, crossed Cape of Good Hope, and then he came up to Madagascar. And it was around that place that the exchange to a Japanese submarine was to take place. Now, the seas were heavy at that time. It was very bad weather. And somehow, somehow they managed to get him onto the Japanese ship. Now, this is off the west coast of India, right? Madagascar is a few thousand kilometers or 1,500, something like that, off the coast of Madagascar. Turns out that there was a Royal Indian Navy ship in the same waters. Now, what happened was that after Subhash Chandra Bose transferred to the Japanese ship and before the submarine submerged, Subhash Chandra Bose actually came up 
when they saw that there was a royal indian navy ship and subhash chandra bose started waving to the soldiers on the royal indian navy ship 1943 february now what happened was the ship's captain he comes to the gunner they used to be called them kalasis i don't know what it is it's a class something this is these are basically gunners who are actually mounting the cannons to fire and he told one of the gunners who was indian to fire at subhash chandra bose and the gunner refused see the mutiny about royal indian navy didn't start after the second world war it started then itself this the gunner refused to shoot at subhash chandra bose and then within a few minutes of course he was smart enough that he is a sitting target so he submerged and went off now this white captain was on a rant and he used words like brown and then another word with seven letters starting with the letter b you know what i'm talking about and he kicked him my grandfather was actually on the deck because this was a big event right subhash so chandra bose surfacing was a big event everybody was on the deck my grandfather was standing by the side of the captain and uh, he did not like the fact that the captain was berating him in fact the captain went and kicked kicked the gunner my grandfather stepped in right after that and he said why did you do that he said who the hell are you to tell me my grandfather was a little hot blooded perhaps that's what is the genes that are descended into me and he just slapped him on the face now you don't disrespect the captain of a ship and and continue to be in royal indian navy now what happened was he was actually arrested in the ship itself my grandfather and brought in for court martial and and this something that he doesn't talk much about but he was in the jail somewhere off the docks of mumbai and believe it or not when the riots happened in 1946 when the ina soldiers were being brought into india to stand trial that's when the navy was the first one to pick up arms bombay karachi calcutta madras everywhere the navy was the first one to revolt so there was a lot of commotion and he escaped and he came home but he never ever went back and asked for look i fought for india i fought on behalf of nothing he was just very quiet he would just tell these things as stories when you know i'm talking about 20 25 years later uh, when we used to play on his lap he used to tell us all these stories now in one time he said that there was big argument so i don't know if it was the same soldier or a different one and in this argument he just like threw the other guy overboard stormy seas see this is what he claims so i don't know what exactly the reason is so i went to england few years ago to try and do some research i was trying to uh, talk to some of my contacts to see if we can find out from the archives if there's any information about this set of events unfortunately i could not find anything i'm still continuing to look for it to actually know the facts of the case but essentially he just returned unsung hero nobody took any notice he just came back to chennai and he was working in other companies like uh, ashok leyland and other com- companies but this is something that was one for the ages that subhash chandra bose actually surfaced and that he waved at a royal indian navy ship the sailors they refused to fire at him that is the important takeaway indeed yeah i mean these are really fascinating stories right and we should know about all of these like what happened in that period at the end of the second world war and india becoming independent there was a lot of interesting historical events that are rarely spoken about right like i mean one of the books that i really like is uh, sanjeev sanyal's revolutionary It talks about a lot of those people during the first world war the gadarite movement and then of course the indian national army and the the naval uprising right a lot of those are fascinating stories that have huge human interest stories that have huge value right but they are rarely documented and i think there is also the problem of how do we understand the indian soldiers in the first world war fought alongside the allies and in the second world war fought on both sides right like say for example the the indian army would have fought alongside the allies and the indian national army would have fought uh, along with the japanese and the germans right and i think it doesn't matter what motivated them to go and fight but what does matter is that they believed in the first world war the promise was that at the end of the first world war britain would uh, either leave india or will give more autonomy and both of that britain didn't do and it will it will take till the 1930s before we would have some sort of autonomy that was promised right and the same happened in the second world war a lot of them went and fought believing that at the end of the second world war britain would leave india and only when the way it panned out britain started prosecuting those who fought soldiers from ina 
then the entire country realized that this won't change unless we start uh, taking up arms against the, the British rule, right? So from my point of view, the, we can easily have both sides of the history. We can understand that in the First World War, a lot of Indians fought to liberate Europe from basically Europeans from killing each other. And in the Second World War, not only we fought to keep Europe safe, but at the end of it, we then went on to liberate uh, most of the modern world, right? Like, like India, countries of the subcontinent, and of course, Indonesia and, and Egypt and few other countries. I do think that there needs to be a serious conversation about how do we look at this history and how do we make sense out of it, right? So I do think that, that those, these personal stories do matter. Like a lot of Indians might have fought alongside allies and a lot fought alongside the Japanese and the Germans. But that doesn't mean that we cannot remember them and we cannot remember their sacrifices and, and what they believed in and what they fought for, right? I mean, if you look at Europe in the Second World War, Spain remained neutral until towards the end. So, so now the Spanish could stand uh, shoulder to shoulder along with the French and the British and um, celebrate the, the defeat of Nazism and fascism, while the Spanish and the, um, the Irish at the time were neutral, right? And of course, Switzerland, which remained neutral till the end of the Second World War. But somehow the Europeans have managed to put those differences aside and, and can celebrate these Remembrance Days and the Armistice Days and build a collective narrative, right? And I think we need to do the same. It might be that, as you know, 1.3 million Indians fought in the First World War and 2.5 million fought in the Second World War. We can't really know what their motives were and what motivated them to go and fight in these foreign lands. But what we do know is that a lot of them fought with honor, uh, fought and died, both keeping Europe free and, and eventually freeing India from colonial occupation. Right. So we do need to remember that. And also we need to remember it for another reason that unless we valorize you know, the, the martial tendencies, the Kshatriyas in us, the next time when we need to face similar problems and when we need when we are in a battlefront we need to dig deeper right like if you look at um, other european countries they have national service and everybody participates in in the defense of their nation but in, our, in, in case of india we don't have national service but we still need to valorize those who are willing to fight in the front lines and fight and give their lives right so the only way to do that would be to have this tradition of remembering them, remembering the war deads at every uh, important events, right? So I do, that's why I think that these personal stories do matter. One hand, we need to document it. I would really like to hear more of those stories, right? So if there are listeners out there and if there are people out there who have interesting um, stories about uh, their family members participating either as in the side of the allies or, uh, allies or in the side of uh, Indian National Army, we would like to hear your stories, right? So we need to document these stories. We need to, we need to remember them. Because that is the only way we can, as a civilization, move forward, right? And, and promote that, as I said in the other video before, uh, the, the Hindu Dharma has always spoken about these two arms, the, the, the strategic, the, the tendencies that are described as the qualities of the Brahman, and of course, the tendencies that are described as the qualities of the Kshatriya, right? Unless you have both, you can never build a highly successful civilization or a society. And I think the times come for India, Bharat, to to sort of valorize both of these tendencies, right? So I do think that personal stories like these are really important. We really need to promote more of these, you know, sharing these stories and popularizing that. Uh, absolutely. And viewers, you will remember Ashali Varmaji, a writer who continues to write for Times, I think. Uh, she had come on my channel and she talked about her father. He was the first Victoria Cross awardee. And I think his name was Lieutenant General Bhagat and about how he did much of the work in the 1962 China war, where this Brooke Henderson report, actually Brooke Henderson did nothing. It was all <laughs> Lieutenant General Bhagat's work. But then they went and saw that it was many errors that polity had committed. And Indira Gandhi, by that time, had become the prime minister. They made sure that no trace of that remained. She had, you have to go back and watch that uh, interview, where she says about how they basically ransacked his office after he had passed away, her father, and burned just about everything they could find because they did not want to accept that the Nehru family, at that time it was Nehru family, maybe then it became the Gandhi family, was actually culpable in India losing in 1962. These are all stories for, you know, for our memory. At least we'll make sure that we won't repeat this mistake. That's the whole idea. And thank you so much for uh, do doing the role reversal today to be the host at, uh, for this program. Viewers, what we want to do is promote this Armistice Day. 
we th this is a single one we are selling them in packs of five in the united states kumar is actually popularizing it in much of uk and perhaps also in europe right a two maybe a couple of words on how you are trying to make it available in the european continent which is where the wars were fought over to you yeah so i am working with some of my european colleagues to see whether we can get the diaspora going to these war memorials and laying a wreath on the remembrance day we want every year we want to grow we want more people to remember these uh, historical events we want more people talking about it more people learning and teaching uh, the next generation about it right so one way to do that would be to go ask your school whether they would want you to come and talk about it right i mean this you can do across europe including the united kingdom you can go during the armistice day which is the 11th of november uh, just a week before or so if you reach out to the school and ask them whether they would like to have somebody coming to the assembly and talking about the indian troops in the first and the second world war fighting in europe and rest of the in north africa and mesopotamia for example right so i think we are we're getting more and more people involved we want a lot we lot more people wearing the marigold along with whatever other remembrance flower they want to wear like for example in the uk and most of europe it's poppies and uh, in israel it's the blood of the maccabees you know the red flower uh, so we would want more people wearing marigold as well and also learning more about world war 1 and world war 2 and our contribution india's contribution both in terms of in the armed conflict and in terms of logistics and uh, financial aid and infrastructure and everything else that we provide right so we do really need to remember those fallen soldiers uh, who gave up their life for a uh, for a higher purpose right i mean particularly the other thing that we want to do is to how vinayak damodar savarkar renamed the uh, the the sepoy mutiny as the first war of independence we want to talk about the naval uprising as the last war of independence right so it is it is very critical that we really understand how india became free the real history of who really fought and died for india's independence need to come out right like for example there is an interesting video with um, uh, dr ambedkar uh, in his interview to the bbc in the 60s where he talks about it what really caused maybe in the 50s or the 60s what really caused britain to leave india and and i think one of the major reasons cited for it is the naval uprising um the realization that would not be tenable for britain to uh, to remain in india at the end of the second world war and um hence the the i think it's called the freedom of india act uh, if i remember right was passed few weeks or months after the naval uprising so it is it's obvious that by 1946 at, at the end of the naval uprising that they have to leave right so we do really need to tell a tell a true story of what happened history is all about sticking to the facts and looking at it from our point of view right like as i mentioned before so uh, unless the alliance have our own historians the hunt will always glorify the hunter so we need to start glorifying our alliance yes indeed thank you so much kumar and viewers please like share and subscribe to our channel and more importantly get your own marigold brush thank you so much sir namaskar namaskar dhanyawad